The city's daily COVID infections approach 30,000. Britain makes you turn on testing requirements for arrivals from China. And residents prepare to celebrate New Year's Eve free from most social distancing restrictions. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The city's latest COVID case low inch closer to the 30,000 mark with some 29,200 new infections reported. That's over 1,000 cases more than yesterday. Hong Kong's COVID infection figures surpassed the 20,000 mark for the fourth consecutive days. Most cases are locally acquired. Among them, five patients carry the BQ1.1 mutant strain, while three other cases were infected with the XBB variant. 104 care home residents came down with the virus. 52 more COVID patients passed away, and that brought the city's COVID-related death toll to 11,594. Secretary for Health Professor Lo Chong Mao said the resumption of cross-border travel will inevitably cause an increase in the number of infections. Lo added he will review the vaccination requirements for inbound travelers from the mainland. Our principle is to align uh, international travelers' requirement with the um, uh, inbound travelers coming from the mainland. So we will be uh, monitoring the situation and consider how we would uh, adjust the um, vaccination requirement for these inbound passengers. Uh, we agree right now, uh, in, the, in the past, we have a discrepancy in this requirement for inbound travelers coming from uh, overseas as compared to the mainland. We will be adjusting this, and our principle is to align this uh, to, have, you know, to, to uh, make sure that uh, the requirement for both sides are the same. The UK, Spain, France and Israel are among the latest countries to require travelers from China, Hong Kong and Macau to show proof of negative coronavirus tests on arrival at their airports. They joined the USA, Japan, India, South Korea, among others that implemented testing earlier. Tracy Furness has more. In a U-turn from a decision just days ago, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak decided Friday that passengers arriving in Britain from China will require a negative COVID-19 test after a surge of infections in China. From January 5th, travellers from China will need to show a negative COVID-19 test taken no more than two days prior to departure, UK's Department of Health and Social Care said in a statement. Spain, following on the heels of Italy, are also requiring air passengers from China to have proof they are negative for COVID-19. Spain's health minister, Caroline Darius, told reporters that her country will be pushing for similar measures at a European level following the surge in cases in China. We know the importance of acting with coordination, but also the importance of acting quickly. That's why at the European level, we will promote the need to review the recommendations to request the digital COVID certificates or equivalent to travelers from China, she said. Airlines will be required to check all passengers from China for tests and passengers will not be allowed on board a flight without providing evidence of a negative test result. China state media called the imposition of COVID tests by various countries on travelers from China as discriminatory. The World Health Organization has asked China to share its information on the disease and the virus periodically. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Back locally, it's New Year's Eve and it's the first time in years that people are free of most social distancing measures after the government dropped restrictions earlier this week. Some residents have secured their seats in spots where they could catch tonight's fireworks and light shows, while others chose to splurge on a fancy dinner to ring in the new year. Sharon Tang has more. The New Year's Eve marks the first holiday after the city lifted a slew of social distancing measures, including the gathering limit. Here at the city's nightlife hotspot, bars and restaurants in Lan Kui Fong started to put up decorations this afternoon. A bar operator said he's expecting business to go up by some 30 percent tonight. It seems three years during pandemic, people are dying to, to do this uh, kind of yearly business or celebration. And now it's open. 
so everybody will come out because that last night is already doing well. This restaurant in Chimsha Chou has extended business hours to 1 a.m. tonight, adding that tonight's booking is almost full. Overlooking Victoria Harbour, the restaurant has priced its New Year's Eve dinner at $1,888 per person. The Chimsha Chou Harbour front keeps getting busier, with some residents getting their seats here as early as 1 p.m. to secure the best view to watch tonight's symphony of lights and fireworks. This man here brought three camera lenses to capture the moment, while others set up tents in the West Kowloon Cultural District. Some residents went for the other option, watching tonight's display on a cruise. Like this cruise here, with all its 360 seats fully booked tonight, we'll go around the harbour for an hour and a half, giving revellers the best views to watch the show. Sharon Tang, TVB News. Following the interpretation of the MPCSC of the Hong Kong National Security Law, political and legal heavyweights in the city elaborated on the meaning and significance of the interpretation. It's the sixth time the National People's Congress Standing Committee stepped in to interpret Hong Kong law since the 1997 handover. In Beijing's latest interpretation, Article 14 of the Hong Kong National Security Law grants the Committee for Safeguarding National Security in Hong Kong the power to make judgments on whether certain cases involve national security. And the decision will not be subject to judicial reviews. The interpretation also says under Article 47, the chief executive can certify if certain cases endanger national security or relevant evidence involves state secrets. The certification is binding in local courts. That means the CE has a say on whether overseas councils without full rights to practice in Hong Kong can work on national security-related cases, as it is a matter requiring the chief executive to certify. Otherwise, the National Security Committee can decide on the matter. Chief Executive John Lee said Thursday night such new rights doesn't expand the city leader's legal powers. So the interpretation of Article 47 does not create extra power for the chief executive in such certification. Last month, the city's top court dismissed the Department of Justice appeal against the decision to allow King's counsel Timothy Owen from the UK to represent Next Digital founder Jimmy Lai in his national security trial. Albert Chen Hong Yi, a member of the Basic Law Committee, said Beijing's latest interpretation doesn't overturn earlier verdicts from the court. The legal academic said the National Security Committee hasn't issued any directives on Lai's case and has no rights to intervene the court's judgment, but he said the government might amend the local laws or policies to handle the trial. They include the Legal Practitioner's Ordinance. Deputy Director of the Hong Kong Basic Law Committee Maria Tam said the interpretation doesn't encroach on the city's judicial independence because national security-related matters concern the executive branch, not the judicial branch. Joining the chorus of support, the Law Society of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Bar Association both welcomed any collaborative efforts with the SAR government over any needs to amend the legal practitioner's ordinance. More details have emerged from the virtual meeting between President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin that took place yesterday. Putin reportedly invited the Chinese leader for a state visit to Russia in 2023 after Xi praised the progress of the strategic partnership between the two countries. Amid Russia's war with Ukraine, the United States expressed concern at the meeting. Naspi Karim reports. For Vladimir Putin, the video summit with President Xi Jinping was like meeting a long-lost friend who he hoped would sympathize with his cause. Xi, however, was more practical and pragmatic in his outlook, saying he hoped both countries can continue their comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination for a new era. Under the shadow of Russia's war with Ukraine, Putin regards Moscow's relationship with China as important. Xi commended Russia for keeping the door open for peace talks, saying China would continue to stay impartial in the conflict and play a constructive role towards any peaceful resolution. In a changing and turbulent international environment, it is important that China and Russia remain true to the original aspiration of cooperation, enhance strategic coordination, continue to be each other's development opportunity and global partner, and strive to bring more benefits to the two peoples and greater stability to the world, she said. The president also criticized the Cold War mentality exerted by some countries, without mentioning names. As Western countries hit Russia with economic sanctions, Moscow has turned to Beijing to make up the shortfall.
In the first 11 months of 2022, two-way trade volume between the two countries reached a record high, with Russia now supplying China with more oil than Saudi Arabia. Xi also hopes to normalize exchanges with Russia now that China has changed its COVID pandemic strategy from dynamic zero to preventing serious cases. Putin congratulated Xi on his recent re-election as General Secretary of the Communist Party of China, adding that he supported Beijing's position on Taiwan and the One China principle. Putin also said he expects Xi to undertake a state visit to Russia in 2023. An official Chinese report of the summit, however, made no mention of any visit. Reacting to the summit, the United States said it was concerned by China's alignment with Russia, reiterating that it had warned Beijing of consequences should it provide Russia with military assistance or assistance invading Western sanctions. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Still ahead on tonight's news. Levy for plastic bags increased from a dollar from today. Former Pope Benedict passes away, passed away at the age of 95. Former U.S. President Donald Trump's tax returns are released. Welcome back. Starting today, Hong Kong's plastic bag levy is increased from 50 cents to $1, and a number of exemptions have been cancelled. Some residents said the new measure will be making life difficult for the elderly. Mimosa Nye reports. Reminder of the $1 plastic bag levy was posted next to the plastic bag stands and self-service checkout counters in supermarkets. Stands for previous free plastic bags were removed. This resident said people may forget to bring their own bags when buying groceries. He added it was important to consider how much the environmental policy is accepted by the public. In the past, people could use free plastic bags to pack fresh meat and fruits, but now they must pay $1. Some residents said it is inconvenient. Ms. Tan said the new measure will affect her shopping habits and she will no longer place wet products in her carrier bags. She also said not all senior citizens will remember to bring their own bags and they may be reluctant to pay a dollar for a plastic bag. Meanwhile, some vendors were unsure about the new levy. This dry goods vendor said she is illiterate and is not clear about the policy. She added some customers would simply stop buying to avoid paying for the plastic bag. The Environment Protection Department said there will be a grace period for the first month. When shops that violate the regulation will be advised. In case of repeated violations, a maximum fine of $200,000 will be imposed. Mimosa Nai, TVB News. Overseas, former Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI died Saturday in the Mater Ecclesiae Monastery in the Vatican. A spokesman for the Holy See said he was 95. A statement from the Vatican said, with sorrow, I inform you that the Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI passed away today at 9.34 in the Mater Ecclesiae Monastery in the Vatican. Pope Benedict had been ill for a few days and hundreds of the faithful gathered Friday at St. John's Lateran Basilica for a special mass in honor of the former Pope. His condition was stable Friday after experiencing a health decline and he was able to participate in a private mass in his room. He was born Joseph Aloysius Rassinger on April 16, 1927 at Marxhall, Germany. His father was a police officer and was from a family of farmers. His early life was not easy growing up in Nazi Germany during World War II. He studied philosophy and theology at the University of Munich after the war. He earned his doctorate in theology in 1953. Benedict was ordained in 1951 and created a cardinal in 1977. After the death of Pope John Paul II, Benedict was chosen his successor. He became the 265th pontiff, head of the Catholic Church, in April 19, 
2005 until his resignation in February 2013. Benedict was the first pope in 600 years to resign. He said he no longer had the strength of body or mind to lead the 1.2 billion strong Catholic Church. This paved the way for the current Pope Francis as his successor. Tracy Furness, TVB News. In Japan, a landslide destroyed about a dozen homes in the north of the country. Two people missing as troops went to help police and firefighters in the rescue effort. Two people, a man and a woman, were rescued from their home that was buried in the dirt, which tumbled down a nearby mountainside in the Juluoka city in Yamagata prefecture. More residents are feared so buried beneath the rubble. A rescue operation involving 80 firefighters and police began shortly after midnight on Saturday. Japan's Ministry of Defense is reportedly planning to develop multiple long-range missiles. According to Kyodo News, the ministry is looking to deploy 2,000-kilometer range missiles by the early 2030s. By around 2035, it plans to deploy 3,000-kilometer hypersonic missiles that can reach anywhere in North Korea and some parts of China. The development comes as Japan this month unveiled plans for its biggest military buildup since World War II. The 320 billion U.S. dollar budget will allow Japan to buy missiles capable of striking China and ready it for sustained conflict. The U.S. House of Representatives has released six years of former President Donald Trump's tax returns. The thousands of pages of financial documents were the subject of a long, prolonged legal battle, and that after Trump broke precedent in not releasing his tax returns while running for the highest office in the country. This report from NBC News. Thousands of pages of Donald Trump's tax returns show the former president paid relatively little in federal taxes from 2015 through the end of his term, including a $0 federal tax bill in 2020 as his businesses struggled. The returns showing that despite a pledge to donate his $400,000 presidential salary, he reported no charitable contributions in 2020, and also showing the billionaire Mr. Trump losing money in four of the six years covered, appearing to undercut a central element of his political biography, his success as a businessman. What Donald Trump does is collects money from businesses he has, and then the businesses lose money. He uses those losses to offset the income that flows into his pocket. Overall, he's a terrible businessman. The filing showing he maintained foreign bank accounts in China, the United Kingdom, and Ireland. And in 2020, reported $78 million in income, but even greater losses, in 15 countries, including China, Qatar, and Turkey. The returns posted today after the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the House Ways and Means Committee in November, ending a three-year legal battle. Mr. Snyder. Aye. A party-line committee vote last week authorized the return's release with redactions. Mr. Trump firing back at what he called a deranged political witch hunt, suggesting Republicans should retaliate in the new Congress next year. The radical Democrats' behavior is a shame upon the U.S. Congress. This precedent must now be applied to the corrupt Democrats themselves. Locally again, 13 people were charged with rioting in relation to the Pali-U siege during the anti-government protests in 2019. They were sentenced to between 29 and 63 months in jail today. The court heard that over a thousand people were congregating on Nathan Road at the time of the incident. Deputy District Judge Veronica Hearn noted that the number of protesters outnumbered the police force, calling it a mini battlefield when the protesters threw bricks and aimed laser pointers at the police. She noted by being present at the scene, the protesters already showed that they agreed with what the rioters were doing at the time. Three of the defendants had defensive weapons such as petrol bombs. A taxi driver was attacked and robbed by a passenger at Island Eastern Corridor early this morning. The police found the taxi in Saiwan and arrested a man. The police received a report at half past six this morning, saying the taxi was found to be driving erratically at the junction of Smithfield Road and Parkfield Road. When the police arrived, the taxi already had a flat tire. The man failed to pass the breath test and was arrested for drunk driving common assault and trespassing. The police said the taxi driver picked up the suspect on Park Street in Jordan to go to Taiwan at 5 p.m. this morning. 
When the taxi stopped at Island Eastern Corridor, the 67-year-old driver got out while the 49-year-old suspect drove the vehicle away. And that's the news. Stay tuned for the news roundup tonight and ring in 2023 together.